Hello and welcome to this month's content for the Premium Trends and Insights Hub. In this month we'll be talking about the decoding the path to purchase and customer journey. And just so you know, there is also a downloadable PowerPoint copy of this presentation, um, a slightly more full and detailed report that sits behind it and an infographic that you can download and share with your industry. Um, so what are we going to be talking about today? So we're going to be talking about this idea of the path to purchase meets the customer journey. And don't worry, we are going to help you understand what that means and also why we've taken that shift in language and what some of the key terms behind that mean. Um, then we'll give me you some frameworks to consider in doing this and taking that first step. So today we'll just be talking about dreaming and triggers. We will be looking beyond that in the next few months. We'll be updating all of our content on this, but it's actually a quite an enormous topic. And we know that many times people don't have time to listen to the whole thing. So we're really just going to focus on these stages. And this is a lot of what you're doing in your destination marketing will be focused on the stages that we're talking about today. So path to purchase means the customer journey. So as I said, welcome. This is now our new hub to do with everything to do with the customer journey. Um, for us, it's a journey, um, I think, in a, an, a, our own conscious way that began back in 2004 with some work we did with Outback New South Wales. Um, and this is the beginning of a journey that we began to work with them as digital media came into this. We sort of added to it with the post holiday sharing elements. And I will talk about all of these in detail, but you can see we are starting to talk about everything from dreaming, which is thinking about it. Where do you go? Collecting your information, actually doing the job, building up to it, the journey, being on holiday, coming back and talking and sharing about it and advocacy. Um, and over that time, um, we've seen others, including Google and McKinsey's, take that journey. So Google began by talking about um, FMOTs, first moments of truth, through to ZMOTs, um, zero moments of truth, and then developed their own path to purchase data, of which we'll be seeing much. And also McKinsey's in about 2008 began to develop their own thoughts on the idea of path to purchase. Um, the one advantage we've got in the age of big data is we can really start to understand this path in a lot more detail and the ways that it works. And one of the things that um, has become very much clearer is that the idea of a path to purchase from the point where people start doing things is not a linear process. Um, and so we've ex included here some examples of what some typical path to purchases might look like for different categories, one of which is travel. Um, so someone who's looking for a hotel in New York and you can actually see uh, where they're going, that they're dodging in and out of things. They're not looking in many um, similar places. So um, in the travel example, they started at Expedia and came back to Expedia. But they went to a number of other PACs, they looked for discounts or uh, whatever. But I think what you can actually see if you look at some of these is so if we look at our, our bookshop examples, we can actually see that they began um, at Amazon um, and they ended up actually ordering from a completely different person. So at some point in their process, this was interrupted and they started thinking about it differently. And finally, we've got one where someone's starting to think about a car. Now, we can see that this is a mobile search. So we're seeing people searching online um, through desktop, but increasingly through mobile. And these days, at least half of all these decisions will be made in a mobile environment around the world. And in places like China, it will be many times that. So again, what you can see with this one is the place the person began is not necessarily where they began to add up. So path to purchase can be long or short, um, they can be multiple, um, and they can go to many different places. Um, so a real life path to purchase, far from that very linear process that we evaluated earlier, can look like this one, which is one of the ones that McKinsey's has looked at from the idea of um, initial evaluations, starts to consider things, going into active evaluation, they might come through and they might go backwards and forwards between that several times. They might make their purchase. They might come back. They might have ongoing um, loyalty. They may come back to you. They may go somewhere else. So that's one way of thinking about it. Um, but I'd actually say for travel, a typical 
path to purchase might look very much more like this one by from Forrester Research. Um, now, this is obviously for in, in the area of IT, but I think it would be equally applicable to a complex decision um, like travel. So you can see in this one that people have multiple loops to what they're doing um, and they're using multiple sources at different stages. Um, they may be going to many different sources online and offline. So typically what a real life customer's path to purchase any individual one may look very much like this. Um, and indeed, I can think of one famous example similar to the Google ones where they looked at someone who was researching Kenya from beginning to end of their journey where they tracked it and then ended up one single transaction they booked to go to Goa. So this is what they might look like. But here's the thing. One of the things I noticed when people started to put up these very complex path to purchases was I would actually see people's eyes glaze over and they'd start to feel terror in their hearts. Um, and one of the other things that I noticed was however much people sort of said, oh, the idea of a path to purchase is dead, it's much more like an ecosystem, they'd actually then fall into starting to talk about each of those stages quite separately within them. So whether they talked about dreaming or inspiration or discovery or exploration, they would talk about those distinct phases. So this brought us back to something that we'd always try to say to people is what we'd shown you was an average path to purchase a kind of simplified version of it and that was really to help you start to get to grips with it and to actually apply it in your businesses um, you know it was always really just for that purpose and and the analogy i'd like to use here if you think about the slightly linear journeys that that we showed you at the beginning is you know the world is not flat it's round but for most of us, we don't find it easy to be carrying a globe around with us. We still continue. We know from our map mania data that people still love and use maps. Maps are not 100% accurate reflections of the world around us. They're smoothed out to make them something that can be practical to use. So I'd like you to think about our more simplified customer journey or path to purchase as being like a map. Although it's simplified, the key stages remain true and they remain useful for you in engaging with customers and um, persuading them to buy you and persuading them to have and, and giving them a great experience in getting them to advocate. Um, now, again, a little bit. So still, you'll notice I'm dodging between these two ideas of the path to purchase and the customer journey. But increasingly from now on, we'll be talking the customer journey rather than the path to purchase. And that's really um, for three reasons. Now, the first of these reasons, and I know this will apply to many of you or for those of you who are destinations, many of the businesses that are your key stakeholders. We know that for many of them, they don't really enjoy. I can, can't count how many times I've heard people say, well, I don't really like doing the marketing. I just really like, you know, delivering the experience. You know, I'm, I like running tours. I like uh, greeting guests and looking after them when I'm, I'm here. But what you actually have to think is the people who end up coming to you are actually a very small subset of your custom potential customers. Um, and for those other potential customers, that first touch point is actually a key part of the experience. Um, and it could be that if you've got those first touch points in, in their customer journey wrong, then many of the people who might actually love your experience might actually be your best almost profitable customers may never get to you. So if you get this wrong, many of them will never come to that bit that most of the tourism industry think really thinks it's selling. So I think we need to realign our thinking there. The second reason is, and the, these are all slightly linked, is we now know a lot more about consumer psychology. So now we know that there are very two different ways that people enjoy a holiday. There's the moment where they experience it and the moment that the remembering part of it. And in a real human sense, it's the remembering part that drives their future behavior and it drives their advocacy that persuades um, that vital advocacy that persuades other people to do things. So while it's true, people will increasingly these days be posting in the moment. It's also just as likely that even as they're doing that, they're curating a version of that. So literally within seconds of experiencing it, 
um, they're doing it. So you'll notice, for example, that there are very few ho-hum moments in social media, for example. Um, what you tend to see are the ones that meet certain criteria. And we know that three elements of experiencing drive the real, the remembering. That first touch point that I've just talked about, the last touch point that they have with you, so the last experience they have, and it may not even be with you, it may be with their trip. So even if they've had the best time in the world with you, if the airline loses their baggage on a trip home, they're still going to remember that part of their journey will always be marred. So the more you're in control of the bits that you have, that's important. And between those two points, any element that generated a deep emotional reaction. So at all points on a customer journey, from the very first moment they touch you to the very last, any point that makes them feel amazingly positive or amazingly negative is really going to be a big part of what happens next. So that's the second reason we need to think about it. It's because that holistic process is those first and those first and last points are so important, along with those bits that generate the really wow or aha or oh my god moments. Um, the last reason, again, um, is that actually these days, because of the complexity of the tourism product, we're selling at every point in the customer's journey. Um, so for some people, they might be coming and saying, well, look, I know I want to, you know, they might know that they want to go and visit the Great Barrier Reef, but they may not actually make up their mind until they get there, what all of the activities are. So will they book their Mossman Gorge tour? Will they even book their Great Barrier Reef tour in advance? So 85% of leisure travellers, certainly in the US, according to Google, only decide on their activities in full after they've got there. And half of those people are looking on a smartphone. The upshot of these three things is I really want you to urge, and the reason I believe the customer journey is in its entirety is so important, is that marketing and an experience are inextricably linked in tourism. They are two sides of the same coin. So when you say you don't like marketing, what you really mean is you don't like one very important part of what you are selling, you are offering the customer. Similarly, if you love the sales part, but you're not so interested in the other part, you need to be thinking about all of those elements working holistically together. OK, just to make sure we all understand what we're talking about by the customer journey. And this is a really great definition um, that we found that by a Harvard Business Review. I think it's a really good thing. And you'll see how it touches on many of the points that I've made. Um, so it's the sum totality of how customers engage with your customers your company and brand. It's not just a snapshot in time, but it's that entire arc of being a customer. And just to be clear, I would probably add the words and influencing others to become your customers. I think that that is really important too, because we know that that advocacy increasingly plays a strong role in driving people's decisions. So that's what we mean when we're talking about a customer journey. And just to reiterate now that we've put it into this more holistic um, framework that this is what we are talking about. Everything from that really first very broad stage dreaming, um, the moment when the decision to do something more active is triggered, through into planning, into booking. Once something's booked, there's a whole stage that I think is really a major opportunity, which we'll be talking about in future sessions. Um, and then we will be going into the en route uh, journey. And we've actually got some new stuff on the anticipating phase what's happening in the destination and then that post holiday sharing and advocacy. But I would say, of course, these days, as we've just mentioned, with smartphones, we're sharing at all stages of our journey. So we are really, really doing that journey all the way through. We are doing that advocacy. So we're really now thinking of this, as I say, not as a linear process, but as an holistic one. And bear in mind that people can be going straight from dreaming to booking if you make that tr trigger compelling enough. Um, straight from dreaming, it can be uh, a long or short time frame, as we'll see. Now, I've talked mostly about leisure, and I'll focus mostly on leisure traveller today because that's what I know most of you are interested in. But for those of you who have business clients, we can actually think of this as a holistic thing. 
Um, and um, I think it's important to say that customers themselves do think of their journey in this more holistic stage. Um, but I mean, we know one challenge is that you are often working through intermediaries for business travelers. It might be corporate travel managers. It might be travel agents. Um, but I think you can see that that process of what they're doing in doing their business can provide a trigger to make a trip. There'll be a planning stage. There'll be a booking stage. There'll be a stage after their booking, but before they go. Again, that may be a few hours as, in, as on some of my trips, but it may be a few months as on our trip to the Travel and Tourism Research Association. There's a journey. There's a destination. And um, now this is quite old. Um, but I think it's worth remembering business travellers share too. So this is the first United Breaks Guitars. Those of you who remember last year, the bad publicity, when United took a doctor off a flight um, under fairly forcible conditions, I can safely say that many of the people who shared that would be business travellers. And in fact, business travellers are very likely to be saying they're very articulate. They tend to be quite passionate and they certainly have very high standards. So don't think they're not sharing and don't think they're not influencing everyone when they're doing it. So what are some of the things you need to consider when you're doing your thinking about your customer journey? So I've shown you that average, but I think it's a worthwhile exercise and one we'll revisit over the coming months to actually start to construct your own customer journey. Um, and so I think what you need to be thinking about is at each of these stages, what is the customer doing? What are the needs that they have from you? Um, what's your job to do here? So what do they need from you? What, what are you there to do? Where are they going for that information that will influence your channel strategy? What types of content or information do they need? Um, how can you, in what you're doing, move them along that and ideally fast track them straight to taking the decision and giving you more money or at later stages once they've given you some money to give you more money? Um, what time frames are they doing in? Because that will make sure that you are making sure you've got your content out there and your channel strategy in place around those timings. And finally, and again, we'll touch on this much later in the process, is are there any friction points? So where are the points that you are losing people? Um, because that's an, if you can smooth those, that's a, 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 an extremely cost effective way um, to win customers. We'll spend more time talking about that over the coming months, probably be focusing on more of the others in, in today's webinar. So coming to the first of those stages, dreaming, which is your chance to inspire. So what's the customer doing? So this is that stage, as we say, the customer starts thinking about their trip. They're moving from thinking about holidays, generally considering actively where to go, what to do or what type of trip. In its early stages, um, this may even be subconscious. People may quite often we're almost always on. So we can be triggered quite casually. It could be something that we see that makes us think um, we should do that. Um, particularly anyone who reads, say, travel sections in online magazines or subscribes to travel or has Instagram feeds, could something like that could could be something that, that does that. Um, so your job is to inspire the customer either to take the trip, which is the first part of it, or to choose you once they're kind of, mm, I'm kind of thinking I might want to go here. Um, and your job is so firstly to inspire, but is to be as emotional as an engaging with your clients as possible. And if your customer works through intermediaries like travel agents, you need to make sure that they too can find you easily and that that content, that you are equipping them with emotional and engaging um, content that they can drive. So you'll see that those words will appear quite constantly. What's the time frame for dreaming? Well, this, as I said, it can be an all the time thing. Um, but for longer trips, so for example, I'm based in Australia, um, many of our international visitors, they're coming 8, 12, even 24 hours, they'll be sinking at least 6 to 12 months out. Um, for closer trips, it can be between 1 and 3 months. Um, for very close trips, it can even be let's go the following day or let's go a week out. So you need to be thinking about that in terms of where your content is and what you're doing. Um, I think it's still true, many travellers still travel at peak periods, so you need to be thinking what are those six to 12 months, those one to three months out at peak periods. Um, and that might be peak periods, so 
you know, what's your peak summer period, but it could also be peak holiday periods in their home market. For example, the Chinese are still very substantially traveling during Golden Week and Chinese New Year or around certain romantic dates increasingly. So, you know, singles days and stuff like that. All of those can be dates where people are doing a lot of their traveling. But if you need to smooth your peaks and think about this, um, you need to be curating your content to say, make sure I've got content that appeals to people who don't have to travel in the peak, like senior travelers. Or for short breaks, those who don't have children can be very spontaneous in their decisions. So I make sure that content's kind of almost always on. You need to start thinking of when you want to be there and plan back from then. Now, I've, I've made a note dreaming versus inspiration because I've heard people talk about inspiration. Inspiration is your job. I think by thinking about dreaming, you're thinking about where the customer is. And if you're thinking through the customer's eyes, you're never going to be going wrong. Um, so where are they going for that information? So this is some work that we partnered with OMD um, on in 2015. And substantially, we've seen nothing that says this is not still true. Um, this is where content, I think if we were to pull it out, number one is search in both markets. The number one place people are going, oh, look, I'm vaguely thinking about traveling, start researching. They're going to do search. So search has got to be a critical thing when you are looking to inspire people. How are they going to find your content? So your your um, SEO for the age of semantic search and artificial intelligence. Again, we've got heaps of resources within the site for you to go away and get into that in more depth. But we do see things like um, uh, TV programs on travel. We might see visitor information centers coming through. That tends to be visitor information centers. It could be in destination, but it's just as likely to actually be in, in their home. So are they going to your national visitor center? Are they going to your destination website? So we see that things like destination websites do tend to come up quite a lot. But we are seeing that content in terms of movies. So, you know, if you've got things being featured in something, you know, get that message out there that that's the case. So use that really well. Um, but I think what you need to be thinking is, so number one is search, visual, um, giving people lots of informed information that could take them somewhere, um, and um, storytelling are all key. And here are some numbers around what having that visual there. So people's willingness to read content goes up 80% if they're seeing a colored, a brilliant colored image, and 82% say it increases their um, attention span and recall. A little bit more on where they're going on that. Um, so we're still seeing that video, uh, word of mouth is really important, but we need to think of word of mouth as being both online and offline. So yes, people will be having the conversation about where did you go on holiday, where would you recommend? But increasingly what will be driving that is um, social media channels and particularly video channels. So um, Google has pointed out that 65% of travelers, and this is a couple of years ago, so this will have gone up, use video when they are thinking of taking a trip. So two thirds of them are going off and looking at videos. 16% um, of millennials in the US use Facebook um, to tra plan travel, but so do one in 10 of those over 40. So this is not just a youth market. And we're increasingly seeing, led by millennials and Gen Z, but other groups using Instagram to plan travel. Um, and what we saw was, you know, 60% also saying, OK, it's not just to inspire me, but it, I'm using it to narrow it down. So we need to be thinking that that is um, communicated digitally and it could also be consumed on a mobile. Again, Google tells us that now mobile is number one place where people are consuming this type of content. Um, and increasingly, they'll be finding it. So when they're doing that search, they'll increasingly be using voice to do so. So plan for voice, plan for mobile, and make sure your content is optimized for mobile when you are thinking about your strategy and putting it out there. Now, if you do have an, a budget for advertising rather than um, aiming to earn media, um, this is a good stage for earn media because this is a stage where we, we saw both in our research with OMD and with work like people like Expedia have done, 
is that it really um, you can see that it's the initial stages when I first started thinking about it is when advertising has its most impact and that's both online and offline and we can see people you know amazingly so 38 percent of Canadians and around 30 percent of, of Brits and Americans all said they were inf in influenced by advertising um, the amazing thing to me is that that's the people who admitted it. So you can probably at least double that in saying that um, people were influenced. So, um, again, if you're looking at things like pay-per-click, you're looking at um, having your programmatic advertising or even if you're participating in traditional advertising through brochures, in print, any of that, really do think about this as being the right stage to be doing some of that unless it's a completely tactical convert them now offer or unless you want it to be the lowest price because the work that we did with omd when we tested what were the things that would get people to click through we clearly saw that the more emotive the more engaging the more visual that advertising was the more likely it was to be successful in driving people to do things so if you want to sell, and this will become more important as we turn to the trigger, you need to be thinking about that. What types of content or information do they need? Now, again, I've talked a lot about content here and people could be thinking, oh, my God, we don't have money for this. So it's about what, again, think about what would engage people. Anyone can be an artist. You just need a good idea. And if you're telling a great story, you can do it very, very simply. You know, it doesn't always. Yes, a nicely produced video and the examples I've shown here are really great ones. But, you know, it doesn't have to be that. If it's got a really great story or it's a really wow moment, you know, if your hand isn't perfect and it's not, you know, just get it out there and see. And, and the other thing I'd say is try and fail fast, see what's working, change things all the time. So these are some examples. So Korean Air, now this was a really formal communication where they used um, destinations and they invited people to do a competition. A competition can be a great way to engage people. It doesn't even need to be your own content. So I, and when I was searching this, I found a number of examples and this is just one. Some of the others were a little bit harder to share and hard to see how you'd get them to work. But USA Today considered this Corona ad to be one of the best travel ads for inspiring travel. So if you're seeing content like that, you're seeing an ad that's using a place that you're in or getting a message out that can be there, by all means, consider using that. Um, Look at nice angles. This is an Instagram ad for Rottnest Island. This is one of the most shared, according to Pop Sugar, this is one of the most shared images on Instagram. So up uh, for WA um, and, you know, Rottnest, it is a very popular destination, but it's certainly not a capital city. So it is driving dispersal. And, and I think there's so many great things about this image, the angle it's taken at. Um, the fact that it's got people in it, so it's a human engagement. You're not seeing crowds, but you are inviting people to step into that picture. And this is one of my favourites. Now, this is posted by Tourism and Events Queensland. So this is working with your SDO or your regional tourism organisation or your state DMO, depending on how you describe them, where you are in the world. So this is the Noosa, Dog, the Noosa Surfing Festival. And one day of this is the Dog Surfing Festival. Um, this gets picked up globally around the world every year the BBC returns to this. So this is a great example. Inspire and engage. And as I say, tell a story like this rottenness one. Even if it's with an image, it tells a story. It tells a story of pristine place. It tells a story of space and beauty and serenity. But it's got people in it. It's not just a place with no one. It says somebody wants to be here, but it's not going to be overcrowded. Now, I've talked about social media. I would be remiss. Um, this recording was done just a few weeks after Facebook, uh, a few days after Facebook changed their rules. Um, with search being the number one pay, people seek inspiration and you'll see everything else. It's important that you have these content linked to your website. It will build your presence in search and it makes you less vulnerable to the types of changes that um, Facebook can make. So we've heard from many people, oh, we don't have a web page anymore. We've done it all on Facebook. Well, here's the news. Those people are now going to be struggling until they start to give Facebook money or until they can drive organic traffic on their Facebook page to get people not just to like things, 
but to share them, which is a much harder task and actually way harder and, and in the long run, way more expensive in terms of the scarcest resource in your business, which is time, than having your own website. So do not ever forget your own assets as a source of this. OK, so now we're moving to how do we trigger people to move from that very nebulous stage into something like that. Um, this is not really external to the customer. This is not what the customer is doing at this point. This is something that this is what you are doing to stop the customer imagining their trip and start doing something about it. So your job is either to create a trigger moment or to leverage the triggers that naturally occur to your advantage. Um, again, this depends on the customer. An estimate for Expedia is that between the point of um, start and the point before that they reach booking, it's actually around between one and 45 days. And in the case of a short break or a staycation, it could be that day or a few days from now. Um, what triggers people um, is really the strength of emotion. Now, this again is a comparison of Australia and China. And what we saw for Australians, often particularly for domestic trips, but also for, you know, it's wanting to reconnect with their family and friends, just wanting to get away um, a little bit more like um, destinations. It's about creating a sense for people um, that it feels like time. But destination and aspiration to visit the destination is really what you've got to be creating. So you've got to be creating that feeling that they must come to you and they must do it now. And that's really what's driving it um, for them. So broadly similar overlap, but that slight difference in what's driving it further. Um, don't underestimate the importance. Um, electronic direct mail EDMs do not have not gone out of fashion. Emails and your database remains a key source. Again, this is from the OMD data. We saw 37% of people said that they use those emails to trigger planning. 44% in China said that they did the same. And that was both the deal one. So deals are still important, although please, deals make them value add, not discount if you possibly can. Um, and standard EDM. So it was that standard EDM plopping in the thing was saying, yes, I actually have to do this. So, you know, an email saying, hey, we've just had those amazing rains. The birds are coming in. Even if, you know, in some cases we've seen people do that with a flood, it can actually trigger people to start planning things. Um, um, interestingly, I saw a lot of work um, by travellers with accessible tourism needs looking for Groupon deals for accessible properties. So again, um, that's where that tactical trigger, that's where things like group buying sites, again, value add rather than discount, will tell people what it is. Um, but please remember, travellers will know where to open your email, or even if you send them a direct mail, it will take them about two and a half seconds to know whether they should do that. So test what gets opened and learn and try to replicate the things that get it, get that impact. And always be thinking, how can I make this? I've got two and a half seconds of attention. How can I be filling that? Um, the other big change since we last looked at this topic is that um, we need to start thinking about the importance of messaging apps and social messaging and um, that. We'll talk more about this later in the planning stages where we talk about the importance of things like chatbots and informing and getting people to book. But in providing that trigger, do start to think increasingly about messaging apps. Um, so we've seen estimates that the market could be as big as 2.1 billion users of messaging apps. We've actually seen uh, business intelligence now reckons that um, messaging apps have surpassed the top big for social networking apps. So more people are going into Facebook Messenger these days than are going into Facebook. Um, so firstly, you need to start thinking about this as a channel to engage people. But that means, again, that you've got to be looking at having great databases and you've got to be looking about who you can connect with through Facebook Messenger and thinking about this and understanding who the customers are you're trying to reach. Because properly used investment in Facebook, we've successfully used Facebook advertising ourselves and Facebook Messenger is something we're increasingly looking at in our business. Um, and here are just a little bit of a guide to some of the most popular. So WhatsApp, Viber, WeChat, Line, Talk, some of them. So again, social messaging, um, need to be thinking about these sites and which ones your customers might be on. 
OK, what types of content? So as we said, um, around 10 percent of travellers, when we talked to them in both China and Australia, said their trip was triggered by a deal. Um, deals, again, some of these are priced. We'd always encourage you to make a discounted option your last option. A bundled, compelling, you're getting all this for the price of that is really there. So this is a case study, um, and this is actually a true story of a friend of mine. He'd signed up to get a flight deal alert. Um, it came through on a Friday afternoon. Great deal to another capital city. It was such a great deal. He had to take it, but he had a narrow window to do it in. So he booked that non-refundable ticket. He had about three hours to do it in. He researched the cost of getting to and from the secondary airport the flight went to, and it was actually going to cost more than he'd saved on the flight. But a hot deal makes us behave impulsively, and it can get you there. As I said, we're not a great fan of deals, but used while they can drive behavior. Value add if you can, but if you're discounting, make sure people can understand why you're discounting. So, you know, are you doing it through the rainy season? Are you doing it midweek when they can see you're a business, hope, um, you know, you're a leisure hotel? Are you doing it weekends when they can understand that you might be a business hotel? So don't make them think that they can always wait for a discount and do create urgency when you're doing it. Some triggers that you could think about using. Now, these are some that we came up with, but I'm sure you can think of others when you're doing your own customer journey marketing. So the return to work. So um, I'm setting Australia recording this in January. Everybody's just gone back to work this week. This is actually a great time when people might be thinking, oh, my God, wouldn't it be great? Imagine if you got a message now saying, I, you know, is it time to think about your Easter break or your Queen's birthday break? Um, you know, even worse, if you're in the northern hemisphere, people are coming back to work, it's cold and dark. They'll be doing job searches. What if while they're doing their job search, they saw an ad that said, don't change your job, just plan your next holiday. Um, think about customers with life events. So kids leaving home, both the last trip before they go away, the first trip with that. So can you trigger people to come choose you, take a trip? The weather particularly seasonal or even short term. I've always, again, when the clocks change for it to make it winter somewhere, I think that's actually a great time to be out there saying, would you like to come somewhere warm and sunny? Or if you've had a great snow dump or you've got great summer weather coming. Um, is there a news item out there? But please be careful. Do not grandstand on bad news. You have to tread carefully around this. And I've got some examples of how you can do that in a fun way. Customerversaries. So if you've got things about your customers, not just their birthdays, although those kind of more standard milestone birthday deals um, and other deals. But, you know, if it's been, oh, we haven't seen you for a couple of years, would you like to come back? And here's what we can offer you. And here's what things that you're doing, upgrades, changes and downtimes. Now's a great time to visit. You could have, you know, there'll probably only be three other people on the beach at the moment. Why don't you come? It's still beautiful. All of those are things that you can think about using. And again, some fun or true ones. So this is one. Um, we partner for a destination with Affinity. And one of the ideas that they had um, for the destination they're serving is quite close to a major capital city. So let's just say if the weather forecast is triggering something that says tomorrow, uh, you, get, you know, it's Thursday come it's going to be a great weekend even if it's out of season if you say the temperature is going to be lovely and warm and sunny why don't you come this weekend sending out an instant message like that can actually trigger people to go why the heck not it's not a long drive i can just go and do that and you, if you've got links to get them to fulfill and book now and if you can't book now um please go away and make sure you can before you do anything else because that's a clear friction point for customers um this is not a travel example, but I absolutely love it. In 1999, the US slapped tariffs on Australian lamb with no warning. So Australian lamb, and those of you who follow my, my social media feed on our Facebook page will know I'm a big fan of their ads. They came out with an outdoor ad um, that sat in some really great places. And it said, the US just slapped a tariff on our lamb. We prefer rosemary and garlic. And there was a mass watering image of lamb with rosemary and garlic. And I was stood at a bus stop and my mouth started watering. And you know what? I put lamb on my shopping list that week. Um, it can also be a switch sell opportunity. So people make sure your place is where your competitors are. And we'll talk a little bit more about that once we get into the planning stage. But do have a think about some of those kind of things. So, you know, if you're, somebody's out there looking for you 
uh, for your competitors, can they look for you? So, you know, when you're setting things like your Google alerts to see what people are searching for, make sure you've got Google alerts on some of your major competitors or people who are selling similar products to you. Of course, yours is unique, but who else might the customer be considering? So that's the end of our introduction to the whole idea of the customer journey and the switch from path to purchase and also a little bit of a talk into the idea of um, our, our dreaming and our trigger stages. Um, and you can see now why we split it up. Because it's so much to think about, we're re-rolling this out over the first half of calendar year 2018. So the key diaries, times for your diary, this report out now. Um, next month, February, we'll be talking about how you can fast track customers through planning and booking and engaging them through anticipation. Um, in April, we'll be talking about how you can make your in-destination experience memorable and shareable. And then we'll also be talking about how to um, operationalize, we'll take that overview of how to cus customize your own customer journey map and then also how to make it easier for customers to buy you by creating a friction map and we'll give you some practical examples of that um, and in May what we'll do is bring all of this together and have one large full and final report but by then you'll be applying so much of this you'll have so much business that you'll be able to employ an extra staff member to come back and listen to that well that's my aspiration anyway so as always uh, thank you for listening and we do hope that you enjoy this. As always, please share your feedback with us. If there's anything you'd like to know more about, if there's anything you'd like to change, if there are things you want to share with your industry, as we say, um, the terms of the contract that you have with us are that you can take extracts from this to put into funding applications, loan applications, um, to share key highlights in newsletters and things. Um, but we will have infographics available for you. So you can go in and download the infographics to start using that and sharing that with your industry. So once again, thank